to buy or just leave it on the seat or even just hand it to one of the members so that we can have a record of your attendance and uh, know that you've been here and uh, do the appropriate things along those lines, send you a card and tell you how much we're, how grateful we are that you're here with us. This morning I'd like to talk to you about seeking the counsel of God. Bill Helm did not know what I was preaching on this morning, at least I don't think that he did, but his prayer went right in line with what we're going to be talking about. And that is the fact that sometimes, due to whatever, we forget to incorporate God in our lives and in our plans. So if you'd be opening your Bibles right now with me to James, James chapter 4, something I think that helps with this text a little bit, at least it seems to make me feel a little bit better about it, because I've had some questions, particularly in verse 17 there, me and a good brother were talking about that just this past week. Notice he starts in verse 13 of James chapter 4, go to now or listen for a minute, or come here, or pay attention. He starts the same thing, uh, uses the same phraseology in chapter 5, verse 1. And so I think you have the same group being spoken to here. And I don't believe that he's so much talking to Christians here beginning in chapter 4, verse 13, as he is to those who are lost, uh, rich people in particular who are lost. He's already dealt with rich some at the beginning and talked to the brethren about how you be careful when rich people come into your congregation, you see the goodly apparel and the, the rings and things they wear, that you don't show them more respect or you pay them more attention than you do someone who comes in, say, in, in not so good apparel. And I believe that's what he's doing here. Now, this is kind of a, a language tool where you would kind of have like a mock debate, where you'd, uh, maybe if you was a speaker, you'd stand there and say, now, come on now, pay attention, and you act like you're talking to someone, even though they're really not standing there. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Now, this was pretty popular among Jewish people, they do, and they've grown notorious for that. They would go from city to city, and they would see the various things that were going well there, and they would see how the marketplace was going, and they'd sell the things that they brought, and they would buy, that they brought, and they would buy things to take to the next place. And so they uh, did pretty good at that for uh, hundreds and thousands of years now. Uh, we fact, the word emporium comes from this very Greek word that's translated here, that the trade. But notice what he says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. Now we use this passage all the time to talk about the brevity of life and how sacred, and, and, uh, sacred life is. We don't know that we're going to have tomorrow. But what's he talking about here? He's talking about people who are not putting God in their plans. They're not petitioning God's uh, throne. And a matter of fact, I believe he's talking about people here who are not even concerned with God. He says, you know not what's on the morrow. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then it vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this and that. He says, but now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil or bad. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. I believe that the, the idea there is even obeying the gospel, putting God somewhere in your life. Know to do right and don't do, and are not doing it. To him it's a sin. Now, I know the principles there, even in our lives today. If we know something needs to be done, and it's within our means to do it, then we need to do it if we can do it. Now, notice in verse five, chapter 5, verse 1, he continues that same thought. Go to now. Ye rich men, weep and howl, and he just flat out lays it on them and gets on them hard. Verse 5, ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and wanted and have nourished your hearts and in, and in a day of slaughter ye have condemned and killed the just and he doth not resist you. Doesn't sound like he's talking to a bunch of Christians there, does he? So I believe beginning in chapter 4, verse 13, he switches there and is using this, this tool of, of uh, figures of speech, you know, to be in a, like a mock debate. Because in verse 7, it's obvious that he switches right back. Be, be patient, therefore, brethren. And so I think that helps us a little bit, but the thrust of what I want to talk to you about this morning is how we live our lives and make this applicable to us. Do I incorporate God in the decisions that I make? Do I think about what God would have me to do? As children of God, we are commanded to watch. Watch. The, the watchman from Ezekiel always comes to mind, that fellow that would stand up on one of those towers on the walls of the city. And his job all day basically was just to look. Look out for things, and if he saw the bad guys coming, to sound the alarm so that the army could muster. As Christians, we are commanded to watch and, and be sober and pay attention. We need to be careful as we walk the walk of life, not to forget, first of all, who we are as Christians, 
who we are as children of God. And yes, I'm talking to Christians this morning, children of God. If you're here this morning and not a Christian, we're going to talk a little bit about that too. But right now, I'm talking to brethren. We need to pay attention that we remember who we are, the great responsibility that has been given us, and that we have to pass on to those that we come in contact with. And not only that, but remember who it is that's against us. Remember that we're in a war with the most powerful foe the world has ever known, the devil, walking about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Apostasy is always close, brethren. That's why it's my responsibility, your responsibility, to make sure that we stay on top of it. If you remember Marshall Keeble many years ago, that famous black preacher, who I am, I believe if Joseph Parton was here, I could get a nod from him, but spoke in this very pulpit. Brother Keeble was responsible for thousands and thousands of, of baptisms, but ba uh, Marshall Keeble was also one that would sound the horn. He would say, we need to be careful, and he would talk about apostasy. And he would try to let people know, listen, apostasy doesn't happen just overnight. Usually it's a gradual thing. He'd say when the churches fall or brethren fall, it's not like a blowout. It's more like a slow leak. And so every now and then we need to get the air gauge out and check the tires. We don't want that to happen. Apostasy is always close. Read the book of Judges. Read the Old Testament. Read the New Covenant. And we find that we are all just a, a, a generation away from apostasy. There's a story of a little girl who comes running to her daddy and she says, Daddy, Daddy, I know what day it is. And he says, well, that's great, honey. What is today? What is today? And she said, it's tomorrow. He said, no, no, honey, let me explain something to you. Tomorrow is tomorrow. Today is today. And yesterday is never coming back. You know, the Lord's not concerned about that millions of dollars you're going to have in 15 years. He's not concerned about what you're going to do tomorrow. What you really have control of is what you're doing right now. And brethren, that's why it's good. And we need to incorporate life into God into our lives. And on a daily basis, talk to him and let him speak to us. Because tomorrow, it never comes. Forgetting God and our planning. God is available to us. God was available to the children of Israel. And now I'm going to ask you, if you will, usually I put all the scriptures, most of them, up on the, uh, up on the slides. But I just did not want to copy and paste the entire ninth chapter of the book of Joshua. So if you would, take your old Bibles, the Old Testament, and if you would turn to Joshua chapter 9. Joshua chapter 9. God is available to us, and we're going to look at a miraculous age when God was certainly available to Joshua and the children of Israel. His will today can be known. We can know God's will, just like Joshua practically was speaking with God almost face to face, if it were. Today, we can know God's will. We need to seek his guidance. James 1 at verse 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Ask. Ask for wisdom. I love John 7 at verse 17. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Now, in the King James, it's not as apparent as it is in some other translations because the King James, remember, I told you, they're going to be just as absolutely conservative as they can be. But this word will here, the American standard, translates if any man willeth. In other words, he has a desire. And that's what that word will in the King James means, the desire, the will, the want to. And then the next will you see is from a totally different <laughs> Greek word. And that's why I appreciate the... Uh, American standard for letting us see that if any man wants to if any man willeth to do the will of God he can know yeah absolutely he can know Jesus didn't say you can know the truth and the truth will set you free John 8 verse 32 he just didn't make that up we can know I, uh, the English standard version really cleans this up for me it says if anyone's will is to do God's will you see you can know and I'm not saying that God's going to come to you tonight and sit on the top of your bed or you know, uh, give him uh, an appearance uh, in your ceiling or something. No, that's now not how God speaks to us today. Now, at one time, he has spoken to the fathers in dreams and so forth, the old covenant. But today, we're told that he speaks to us through his son. Jesus said that the disciples were going to be reminded of all things through, by the Holy Spirit, John chapter 14 through 16. Today, we have the completed revelation. We can know the very mind of God, Paul will tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But it's going to take some effort. It's going to take some effort on your part. 
It's going to take some effort on my part, but the bottom line is, if we want it, we can know it. Isn't that true with everything? I, I just, I admire people. I look at folks today from people who restore cars to collect uh, different things. I mean, people are just neat. And boy, when they put their mind to something, they can do it, whether it be good or bad. I mean, people are interested. But one thing I know for sure is that we can know and that we can do. God tells me that. In James 5, verse 16, I want you to notice the last part here. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Power, prayer is such a powerful tool, brethren, and so many times I think that we don't utilize it. And I know we don't utilize it as much as we should. Remember when Jesus talked about the unjust judge? And he had that woman that kept coming to him, that widow. She had a cause, and he was like, you know, get out of here. You're bugging me. But she kept coming, and she kept coming. And finally says, you know what? I am going to hear her case because she's literally beating me black and blue. She's bugging me to death. I'm going to hear what she has to say. I'm going to rule in her case. Jesus uses in that same text. Remember, he talks about the fella late at night saying, I need some bread. I've got some guests that have come to my house, and I need some bread, friend. The friend opened up the shutters to the house, if you will, and says, do you know what time it is? Man, I'm in bed. My wife's in bed. My children are in bed with me. And you want some Sarah Lee? You know, you can come back some other time, Hoss. I'm, I'm asleep. I need some bread. <laughs> I've got some friends that have come with me. You know, did you not get it, buddy? I told you to go on. What's he going to do? He is going to get up and either shoot that fella, except they didn't have guns back in them days, or he's going to go get those loaves of bread, isn't he? That's what the Lord said we do in prayer. We petition, and we petition, and we petition. Neither one of those is because the guy was too happy about getting out of bed or the judge wanted to hear the case, but because of the much begging, the much pleading, he heard their case. Well, forgetting God and our planning, I want to talk, take a look at a story of deception. As the story of deception right in the middle of a war. Right in the middle of a war, we're going to talk about the Gibeonites today. Now, you've probably heard of those before because they're going to come up again later in the history of Israel. But I want you to turn, if you will, to Joshua chapter 9 and look with me, if you will, at verses 1 and 2. And it came to pass when all the kings that were on this side, Jordan, now they're on the <clears throat> west side of the Jordan here at this point, in the hills and in the valleys and in all the coasts of the great sea, over against Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusites, and just about every kind of ite you can think of right there, huh? Heard thereof, and they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and the children of Israel with one accord. Now, if you pay attention to the screen, you see that line? That is somewhat running down where you would have the uh, Jordan River. The Jordan River, of course, empties out into the Dead Sea. Now, what this is saying, this text is telling us that just about everybody on this side of it had gotten together to war with Israel. They know what's taking place. They've heard the story. You see, it all began as we blow that up a little bit now. We blow that up, and we see that we crossed the Jordan River somewhere in this area. And we went over. We went through the covenant of circumcision, got all healed up from that, and we attacked Jericho in a most unconventional uh, form of warfare. Remember the 13 encompassings of the city once a day and then the last day seven times the walls fell the Israelites conquered uh, Jericho <clears throat> then they'll go and they'll attack Ai but you remember we had a, a situation there with the sin of Achan we didn't lose a single man Israel didn't lose a single man taking Jericho but now over 30 are killed taking Ai and you remember Joshua ripped his clothes and fell down and God, why have you forsaken us? Why have you left us? And God says, get up. Get up. I haven't forsaken you, but there is sin in Israel. One fella, one fella took some things he was never going to be able to do anything with. Remember what he stole? Stole some money, Babylonian garment. What was he going to do? Go prancing down the middle of the camp with that Babylonian garment on? Well, everybody would have known. So he couldn't do that. He couldn't even use the money. Where was he going to go? The PX? Kmart? Walmart? No. He stole some stuff he couldn't even use, destroyed his whole family, and caused these 30-something men, 32 men, I believe it is, their lives. Well, I want you to notice something about Ai. Now, we're right here in the land of Benjamin. It's not, this is divided. This has not happened yet, okay? It's the best map I could find, though. This hasn't happened yet. This will happen later in the book of Joshua. But we're going to talk about these folks who live right here called Gibeon. If you'll notice... On the scale of this map, it's about 6 to 10 miles from Ai. It's not far at all. 
It's not far at all. But we have some things that happen here. First, there was this presumed self-sufficiency. Now I want you to see what happened with me. Verse 3, And when all the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, they did work wildly, or some of the translations say craftily, and went and made as if they were ambassadors and took old sackcloths upon their, old sacks, excuse me, upon their asses and wine bottles, old and rent and bound up, and old shoes and clouded upon their feet, and old garments upon them. So they dress up like they've come a long way and like their food and stuff. Notice it says, and the bread of their physician, uh, and provisions was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua and to the camp at Gilgal and said unto him, to the men of Israel, We come from afar. They were volunteer firemen. They came from afar. You get Okay, y'all are going to be tough. They came from a far country. Now therefore, make a league with us. And the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, Peradventure, we dwell, you dwell, we dwell, try that again, ye dwell among us, and how shall we make a league with you? You see, they knew they were not to do this. In Exodus 22, 3, excuse me, Exodus 23, they were commanded not to make a covenant, don't make a league, a pact, a treaty, if you will, with anybody in the land. You're to eradicate them. You get them out of there. If they won't go, you kill them. If they leave, just, just purge the area of these countries. We can't make a league with you. And so see, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And Israel says that. But now notice what these men say. They said unto Joshua, we are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, who are you? Where you come from? And they said unto him from a very far country, thy servants are come because of the name of the Lord thy God. For we have heard the fame of him and all that he did in Egypt. And all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond the Jordan, Sihon of Heshbon and Og, king of Bashan, which was at Ashtaroth. Wherefore our elders and our inhabitants of our country spake unto us, saying, Take, notice, vict vittles. Uh, Ed, Jed Clampett had that right. It may look like victuals, but it's actually pronounced vittles. With you from the journey, and go to meet them, and say unto them, We are your servants, therefore now make you a league with us. This is our bread. We took it hot from our provisions out of our houses on the day that we came forth to go unto you. But now, behold, it is dry and it is moldy. And I'm sure they showed them. It says, And these bottles of wine which were filled were new, and behold, they be rent. They're busted. And these are our garments. Look at the way we're dressed. We, we were in good shape and we left. We've been on a very long, long journey. Now notice what happens to Israel here. They presumed self-sufficiency. They thought they could figure out what they should do and what they shouldn't do. First of all, they're going to evaluate the evidence. They can look at the bread. It's moldy. Look at those wine skins. Obviously, they're, they're empty and they've, uh, they've had a, you know, they haven't been around. They've, they've questioned the Gibeonites. They seem to be on the up and up. All the evidence supports what they say. So then they fall into the, the second problem. Well, first of all, though, let's notice in verse 14. And the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. They didn't see what God had to say about it. You thought they'd have picked up with that on, on the, with the problem with AI. You thought they would have picked up with that. Because do you remember they went from Jericho? And I mean, God had been talking to Joshua. Joshua had been talking to God. I mean, there was full communication right up to Jericho. And then after Jericho, we just go and attack AI. We didn't talk to God. And we got in trouble as a result of that. You think Joshua would have learned from that? You think the elders, the leaders there in Israel would have learned from that? But they didn't. And they don't ask God's counsel here. Number two, they fell into another common error. They focused on the physical evidence. A lot of people do that today. They want to know if I can't touch, see, taste, hear, or feel God, then he isn't real. And they go on a miracle all alone. They just look at the physical evidence and say, show me God. Well, the Bible says in Psalms 19.1, that ought to be enough. Romans 1 also talks about how men could tell, excuse me, Romans chapter 2, Talks about how men can, from nature, can learn certain things. They can learn certain things. They can learn that murder is wrong. Genesis, uh, Psalms 19 talks about the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. You should be able to tell by the orderness of, of, of uh, seasons, by the orderliness of the time, of, of the sun coming up, going down, the seasons change, the, the planets, things of that nature, stars, that something greater than ourselves that work here. That should have happened. But Israel, instead of looking at the spiritual, instead of talking to God, just looked at the evidence. Even though they were skeptical. Even though they were going, hmm, now where did you say you're from? And I mean, they really quizzed them. They didn't seek God. Kind of reminds you of Eve in the garden, doesn't it? 
Eve knew exactly what she should be doing. She knew the truth. Oh, man, did she know it. We're not to eat of that tree. Man, all those trees out there, we can eat everything we want. But of that one, we're not supposed to eat of it. And then the devil started playing a little mind game with her, remember? Is that right? Has God said that? Now, you've got to ask yourself, just why do you think it is God would want you to eat of that tree? See, let me tell you something. I know something you don't know, Eve. And that is when you eat of that tree, man, you are going to know some things. You're going to have knowledge like God. You're going to know right from wrong. Well, she starts thinking about that for a minute. Maybe that's right. Maybe God's just holding me back. And we find in verse 6, and when the woman saw that the tree was good, ain't nothing wrong with that tree. Why? Fruit on there looks real good. Looks healthy. Looks very appealing to the palate. Why do you reckon God doesn't want to have that tree? It's not the tree's fault. It looks good. And it's pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. It even comes to fringe benefits. Man, I tell you what, not only will you eat, but it's good for your mind. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And guess what? She found out a whole lot more than she ever wanted to know, didn't she? She found out real quick a whole lot of things that she didn't need to know. God didn't keep her from that tree to punish them or to hold something back from them that was going to make them better. He was holding them back from that tree of something that's going to kill them, something that was going to take away their covenant relationship with God. They'd be separated with God from God unless God did something about it, and that's exactly what he did. Why they did not seek the Lord's counsel? Well, lastly, the leaders fell victim to the Gibeonites' play on their pride and ego through flattery. Notice verse 8. They said unto Joshua, we are thy servants. Man, we're bowed down right now. We are under you. And Joshua said unto them, who are you and from whence do you come? And, of course, they went to describe who they were. And we've heard all these things about you. Notice verses 9 and 10. A very far country. And we've heard about the Lord your God. We've heard about your God. He's a lot more powerful than our God. We've heard about him. The things that he did how he took the Amorites, how y'all just walked through them like they were nothing. We've heard about that. And we think you guys are the greatest thing since cotton candy, if you will. We're scared to death of you. We want to make a pact with you, even though we don't live near you. They played on their ego. Proverbs 11.2 says, When pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. What should they have done? Well, you know what they should have done. Should have asked God. Why they didn't seek the Lord's counsel, the leaders indeed suffer shame. Just like his proverb says, proverbial statement, they suffer shame. Notice what happens. Let's go ahead and read the rest of this. Verse uh, 15. And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them. He's made a treaty to them <clears throat> to let them live. And the princes of the congregation swear unto them. So they've had one of those Geneva talks. They've both sat down and got out those, uh, you know, souvenir pens and signed the treaty and it came to pass though at the end of three days notice what happened verse 16 <clears throat> after they had made a league with them that they heard that there were their neighbors uh oh that they dwelt among them and the children of Israel journeyed and came unto their cities on the third day now notice Gibeon was the capital city but there were other cities involved as well you had Kephira and Beeroth and Kerjath Jerem and notice verse 18, the children of Israel smote them not because the princes of the congregation had sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. Now, boy, that's an interesting phrase right there. That is the Jehovah Elohim Israel, the Lord God, Jehovah. The elders saying, listen, you can't kill these people. We have made a covenant with them, and we have made it in the name of God. Whew, that's respect. Here are these people who they've been going through everybody else with the sword. He says, we can't touch them. We've made a covenant with them. And not just a right hand of fellowship or a right hand shake. We've, we've taken the name of the Lord God of Israel and made that into the covenant. We can't touch them. And all the congregation murmured against the princes. Remember we said a few days ago uh, or a few weeks ago that word murmuring is one of those words that murmured. That's, that's exactly what's happening. People are walking off and they're, they're murmuring. They're not happy about that at all. Well, 
The prince has said unto all the congregation, We have sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel. Now therefore we may not touch them. This we will do. We will even let them live, lest wrath come upon us. Boy, if you want to underline something and write a passage down, uh, we'll see exactly how that's going to play out in uh, 1 Samuel. But they are, they're not to touch them. They've made a covenant, and God is going to observe that. Brethren, we reap what we sow. Boy, that is a principle. It's in agriculture. It's in the physical. You know, uh, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's going to come back, and it does. This covenant with Gibeon, not only do you leave enemies of Israel right smack in the middle of their territory, uh, which is going to cause you problems. Remember one of the reasons the Egyptians were afraid of Israel was, hey, listen, they outnumber us. And if an enemy come and they make a league with them, they'll destroy us. So that was one of the problems. But God considered this a binding covenant. They had used his name. Israel had made a league with these people. And so God is just not going to let them walk away. And as a result of that, the first king of the United Kingdom, Saul, his family, and particularly a mother who I just love. I try to use her on Mother's Day as often as I can because she is the epitome of a mama. Rispa, one of Saul's wives, who you'll remember for six months, basically keeps the birds from eating her boy's body. Z bodies. Well, 2 Samuel 21, 1, now there was, days, uh, in the, there was a famine in the days of David. Three years now. It's amazing to me it took David three years to <laughs> ask God about this. Here's another situation. The man of God's own heart. Why didn't after that first famine? David had, you know, access to the human and the human. He had access to the priest. Why didn't he talk to God about this before? Three years after, year after year, and David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, it is for Saul because of his bloody house. Well, what did he do? He slew the Gibeonites. Notice verse 2. And the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, and this is the story we're talking about, but of the remnant of the Amorites, and the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. You see, Saul just discarded that and went in there. He's killing everybody. He's going to get them out of the perimeter. And he did not acknowledge his covenant. Notice God considers that covenant binding. And they asked for six of Saul's boys, and of course, that's exactly what happens. They're taken and they are killed. It's frustrating when you read this account because God's counsel was available. God was there for Joshua. If you turn back just a few chapters, or I'll read it to you. You don't have to. In Joshua, I've asked so much out of you today. We've done covered the Old Testament, New Testament. In Joshua chapter 1, beginning with verse 6, notice that God is, Be strong, good courage. For unto this people <clears throat> shalt thou divide for an inheritance. Verse 7, Be strong and courageous that thou mightest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand nor to the left, that thou mayest proper, whithersoever thou goest. Verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, thou shalt meditate upon therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have success. Notice the last part of verse 9 with me. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Joshua, ask God. You know, you almost find yourself wanting to say, God sees through these things. He knows they're deceiving them. But he doesn't do it. He doesn't do it. They'd failed to do this at AI. You wish they'd have picked up on it. But once again, they do not learn from their past. Israel's real good at this. And I'll tell you something else, brother. I'm afraid America's getting real good at it. Israel, you want to see the history of Israel, uh, particularly during the time of Judges. Just read Judges chapter 2, verses 12 through about 16. Same thing over and over. Times get good. They forget God. They go off and doing all kinds of things. God raises up a nation to come in and punish them. They start hollering to God saying, help us. He raises up a judge, and that's what you have for the next 15 judges over and over again. And if we're not careful, we'll fall into the same mistakes. History is doomed to repeat itself if we don't learn from it and try to change it. Try to change the mistakes of the past. This didn't happen here. Didn't learn from AI. They were careless, negligent. They failed to pay attention to the covenant relationship. They were in with God. And brethren, this is where I want to bring it back around to us. We are in a covenant relationship with God. When you obeyed the gospel, you became a member of the Lord's body. You're part of the bride. You're in a covenant relationship now with God. The new covenant that Jesus died for, the blood that he shed, we are a part of that covenant. 
and we shouldn't do anything, uh, you know, without God's helping us do that. You know, we, we realize that. Talk about the marriage covenant for just a moment. A few years ago, I got a wild hair, and I wanted to buy a truck. But, you know, when I did that, I didn't go ask Marty Helm what she thought about me buying a truck. Although it would have been nice to know what she thought about it. Come find out later on, I'd help her husband haul a lawnmower over. But I didn't, uh, I didn't ask some other man's wife. But I will tell you who I asked. And don't y'all say boss. She's looking at me funny. Well, we did talk about it, honey. Don't you remember? Okay. Obviously, obviously uh, I must come up with a new scenario here now. Is there anything I ever talked to you about? But I'm in a covenant relationship with Stephanie. You see, and so what her opinion about things such as purchases of things of that nature, moving and so forth that we've done over the, that's something you talk about. I, her opinion is important. I'm in a covenant relationship with her, not another man's wife. Well, we're in a covenant relationship with God. Israel was, within a, was, within a, was in a covenant relationship with God, and yet they didn't seek his guidance. They didn't ask him, you know, hey, what about this situation we're in? And hence, you've got a lot, of, a lot of misery for lots and lots of years because remember what we said? We reap what we sow. It's a universal principle. Well, how do we forget God's counsel? I think the same way. There's a temptation to trust in our own efforts. A lot of times we think that God's too busy to be worried about my little old mundane things that I do during the day. But that's not the case at all. There's a temptation to focus on the physical. A lot of times we just look at what's around and we go through our daily business and we don't pay attention to the spiritual things. We don't pay attention to God. We don't pay attention that God's concerned about the spirit, the physical things in our life as well. We know that God's concerned about reading our Bibles and studying. We know that God's concerned about assembling with the saints and, and teaching Bible classes and what goes on in those Bible classes. We're all about that. Man, we really appreciate that. But when it comes to those mundane things, a lot of times we just think, well, you know, I'm on my own on this one. There's a temptation also to be prideful, and I mean always with human beings. We're the same way we were in the garden. That doesn't change. Man has not changed since we were created, okay? Situations have changed. Environments have changed. Some television, things of this nature. But people are, are, are the same. And I think all three of these happen, not because we have a lack of a faith in God, that God can do. We know God can move mountains. We know that God can destroy cities. We know God can bring down kingdoms. He can raise up kingdoms. We know God does those kind of things, and we're like, go get them, God. But, boy, I don't feel good today. Do we think God might help me with that? Do we think God might take care of the, well, I've got a doctor's appointment today, you know, and pray about that, or I've got a, these certain things. I've got to work today. Help me, you know, do we pray about these things I need to get done today? Lord, help me to have a, the kind of mind to get, get through those. We kind of seem to let God out of those day-to-day -day things that we spend most of our time living. And if you don't let God have a part of the day-to-day -day things, the everyday parts of your walk, then you're just spending little time with God. We often think that God is only concerned with the big things, the spiritual things. We don't seek his counsel on practical things. What are I talking about, money? What about finances? Do we talk to God about our money? Do we talk to God about job changes for money, you know, for gains and money? Do we talk to God about what to do with our money? What about our careers? How many of us have actually prayed and thought about what am I going to do with my life? How can my life be best spent going to heaven, first and foremost? And thought to think about dating choices. Do we think about that? Do we talk to God about who we date? Because there's this old saying in our country, and that is, you marry who you date. And that's just the way it is in America. That ain't the way it is in India. You know, you marry who mom and dad, you know, prearrange. But I'll tell you something that really scares me. And I was just reading this in the paper. Maybe some of y'all read the editorial thing. And that is, you marry nobody. You realize that? That marriage is almost a thing of the past in Europe. It's about gone. Like 80% of the people there now are, 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 are not married. It's coming 50% quickly in our country. But let me share a little thing with you on this because this really blew me away. I know Europe's been gone for a long time, and we're just chasing her as fast as we can. We're trying to go after her liberal laws and throw God out of everything. And we're chasing behind England just as quick as we can. I kid you not. Go back, look when they put abortion out there, look at their euthanasia and things of that nature, and look where we are. We're about 10 years behind and gaining fast because we love to have it so. But now let's think about those groups that 
are not as liberal thinking as most Americans and Europeans. Think about your Muslims for a minute. You don't get much more conservative than Muslims. Do you realize their population is flatlined? Even they, too, are not marrying. I was reading this thing about the Japanese culture the other day, and you know how big they are into family. I mean, they're practically into ancestor worship. Do you realize most men now in Japan don't want to marry? They're not even really interested in dating. What's happened? Been a big change. How do we forget God's counsel? Time management. Think about that for a moment. I know some members of the Lord's church can only find one hour a week to assemble with the saints, even though we're here at no less than four. They're never here more than one. That's time management or just lack of desire. What about entertainment? Do we think about God when we think about the things that we watch, things that we put in our mind? Marriage? Oh, me. You had better find someone who is going to help you get to heaven. It's the number one relationship in your life that's going to have an influence on where you spend eternity. Do you realize that? And instead of looking for the hottest gal or the buffest boy, as they like to call it nowadays, I guess, I guess that's probably 10 years old now. It's probably something else. But uh, instead of doing that, you better be looking for somebody that's going to help you get to heaven. <clears throat> Relationships. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 hadn't changed since last time I looked at it. Evil companions, corrupt good morals, our friends, who we run around with. How often do we seek God's counsel and what these looking at these things we'd say well that's just the mundane kind of everyday things of no they're the the essence of life that's that's how we live think about your routine during the day that's where you spend most of your time you don't spend most of your time at the church building you don't spend most of your time singing praises to god with the saints that's just a very small part of our time brethren if we don't incorporate god into our lives and seek his counsel in our lives through the week and in those things that we're missing we're missing out a lot. God has made his counsel available to all of us. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. We can quote that. But why is that? That the man of God may be complete, perfect, full up to every good work. We have access to the very throne room of God. So that we can come boldly, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Not just sneaking up there. We can come boldly to the throne room of God. Just as Bill said this morning in his prayer, Thanking God that we have this ability to petition his very footstool, to be able to talk to God. We have access to the throne, and as we looked at earlier in this lesson, he's promised us wisdom, but there's a part of it we, we're a part of. We've got to ask. We have to ask. God desires that Christians walk with him each day. Remember the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. How many of us pray every day? Brethren, I know years ago, I could not raise my hand up and say that. There were times when I would go from service to service without ever praying to God. Thinking self-sufficiency, you know, not wanting to bother God sometimes. That's not how we should live spiritually, not at all. Give us this day. Do as the Lord has taught. Let's be folks who are every day communicating with God, asking his counsel, searching out the will of God. God's not going to appear to you like he did Joshua and say, hey, open up that book, study it now. Don't go to the left, don't go to the right. Stay in the middle. He's not going to tell you that like he told Joshua. But we have the same information Joshua did, don't we? We can read exactly what God said to Joshua. And we can say, you know what, I can learn something from that. If I do the things that Joshua did, God's going to bless me. Meditate upon it day and night and learn from those things the things that God would have us to do and have us not to do because it's the best thing for us just like with Eve God wasn't trying to hurt her he wasn't trying to keep something from them that was going to help them out he was trying to save them he was trying to keep them from that which would kill them and yet they thought they knew better than God and I think sometimes that's what hurts us especially when all those around us are hurting. You know, too many times we act like we're on a covert mission, like people undercover, you know, spies. And we don't seek God's counsel like we could. He's right there. The church is deceived. We're deceived, brethren. If we think that the work is up to us, me individually, it's up to Ron Gilbert. No, it is up to us collectively, but walking side by side with God. Don't be a lone ranger Christian. And I'm afraid too many times I've found myself to doing that. You know, you get discouraged sometimes. You think, I can't get the brethren to do nothing. I'll tell you what, if it's up to me, if it is to be, it's up to me, you know. So I'm, I'm just going to do it. 
Brethren, we need, we need help. We need to help each other. From the Sunday school room to the pulpit to the elders' meetings to everything that we do. From the soccer fields to the grocery store, everything. Let the classroom and the pulpits ring with the counsel of the Lord. The elders' meetings should be uh, saturated with the counsel of the Lord. From the soccer field to the worship time, every part of our lives, let it be saturated. Let us be influenced by God's will for our lives. Let us not, and take this example, forsake the counsel of God. We can spend a life reaping what we've sown. If you're here this morning, you're not a New Testament Christian. Well, this lesson really hadn't been for you much. You see, the, 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 what I've been talking about is those folks that are in a covenant relationship. Of course, I think James was kind of telling folks, listen, you better get in that covenant relationship because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So if you're thinking about putting something off, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, hey, I'll, I'll do that later, you don't know that you have later. So we can take that principle from verse 14 in James 4 and say, listen, you may not have tomorrow. You need to obey the gospel. You need to be a part of that covenant relationship, which means you've heard the word. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and are willing to confess that before men, repenting of your sins? Then you need to be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The Lord will add you to the church. Maybe some of you here this morning have done so in the past, but you've left your first love. You need to come home. You notice Revelation 2.10, be faithful unto death. Sometimes uh, we practice a little idolatry, don't we? We kind of slide God out of number one there, maybe down two, three, four, and we put other things in front of him. Well, that's the same thing as idolatry. Not, not a little image, but something. Something's filled your heart where God ought to be. Come back home. How do we do that? If it's something of a public nature, then confess it publicly. Let the confession be as public as a sin. But if it's something that's private, you just let things kind of get out of whack, then fix it. Repent and pray God this be forgiven you, as Peter would tell the sorcerer Simon and uh, Acts chapter 8. If we can help you in any way, we encourage you to come as together we stand and sing.